Aloha, and welcome to Books, Books, Books through Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Elaine Gallant, and here's where we'll talk about reading books, writing books, and everything in between and beyond. Today, I have a crime thriller that I can't wait to talk about that involves the Catholic Church and its ongoing problem with pedophilia. Now, I know this can be a very heartbreaking topic, but I have with me today the novel's author, Tom Hogan, to guide us through this discussion. Welcome, Tom. Thanks, Elaine. Nice to be here. Well, I'm very happy to have you. First, I want to say I wanted this interview so very much because I was raised Catholic and I seriously think I could have been your character, Carla Jessa. Okay. <laughs> Everyone seems to love Carla. I love Carla. I love the fact when they ask her if she's Catholic and she says, um, uh, what, is, what does she say? I'm lapsed permanently. Lapsed, yeah, uh, lapsed early and permanently. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I always say I'm Catholic and upset about it. So there you go. I, I'm with her on that one. Mm -hmm. um, not, to, not to knock the Catholic Church. It's a very good religion. Um, but uh, there is a problem in the Catholic Church. And, and I love the fact that you have made, you have written a crime thriller that uses this as its base. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself first and what might have influenced this novel? And then we'll go into the novel itself. Sure. Um, as far as the novel, it's, uh, the background, religiously, et cetera, um, I studied religion, in fact, for a year. Uh, I was in the Catholic seminary, so I'm familiar with the, the system. Uh, I wound up uh, studying in um, uh, religion and getting um, uh, degrees in it, uh, um, bachelor and master's, working in biblical archaeology. So I was in religion, but not in the theological. And in the, But in the process, for one year, I also lived in a Protestant seminary just because it was the only place when I was doing archaeology that would hold me. So I've got experience with both the Catholic and the Protestant seminary systems and how different they are. And uh, then as a professor of religion, I obviously was exposed to uh, any number of different religious types, including the priests who were at some of the schools that I taught at. So I was pretty familiar with um, the church as well as the people within it, and then the Protestant side of the coin as well. Yes, and you have a very diverse background, actually. You have written several novels, which we'll get to shortly. Um, you've written screenplays and have won awards, uh, in particular, the Page Competition and the Austin Film Festival. You've also written for Newsweek and a number of political and travel publications, including, including the Jerusalem Post and the Bulwark. But prior to joining Silicon Valley, and I'm gonna just read this part, where your agency, Crowded Ocean, launched over 50 startups. You are a professor of Holocaust and Genocide Studies at Santa Clara University and US, uh, UC Santa Cruz. I just wanna make sure I have all of that and if there's anything That's you all want to correct. add. correct, there you go. Oh. Okay, so let's talk about the empty confessional. Um, do you, I, I've already identified with Carla. Do you identify with Father Michael or Father Gabe? You know, uh, Father Gabe, definitely. Um, you know, not because I'm I'm 26 years old with a buff body and uh, skilled in uh, the martial arts, but because of the idea that you could have a calling, which I thought I did when I was younger. And yet, you know, the calling brings with it an institution, in this case, the Catholic Church, which has got some, some laws and some practices that even at 18 years old, you sit there and raise an eyebrow and go, you know, this may not be for me. And so, you know, that kind of um, internal drama that he had, as well as the idea that Catholicism comes with it, the idea of um celibacy which isn't very attractive to a 17 or 18 year old young man in california during the 60s and early 70s is uh yeah so i identified with him uh i'm glad you identified with carla but um uh had you identified with father gabe we would have had a different conversation here so <laughs> but yeah all right now um Let's talk, uh, there are, you bring this out in the novel briefly that there are several kinds of pedophilia. Um, 
pedophilia being the preference for children ages under 11 to 14, and ephophilia and hebephophilia, which is a preference for children, boys being the first, girls being the latter, of ages 15 to 16. Uh, I don't know where I want to go with this because I, I just wanted to define it first because there are levels of pedophilia and, and we don't know how far the Catholic Church has gone, the priests have gone with this and I, and, and I wouldn't even try to figure it out. So I'm not, gonna, I'm not even gonna go there. We're gonna stick with the book. Yeah. <laughs> the first thing to know is that it's never called pedophilia according to a conversation between Gabe and Father Michael Montgomery which you don't know is really a priest until very late in the story, I have to say. Mm -hmm. So I was, I was tickled to, to, to learn that. I hope I'm not spilling any, uh, oh, no. you know, anything there. But it's always considered inappropriate contact by the Catholic Church. Right. No, I mean, if you look at it, and, and uh, the reason that I parsed the different kinds of uh, pedophilia was not because I wanted to be scientific. It's because, uh, as I was pointing out in the conversations between the priests who are investigating the scandal, uh, there were times where the church used just those legal distinctions to end a case. In other words, you're charging us with uh, pedophilia when in fact it's another one of these corner cases and the case was dropped, not because of the merits, but because of the legalities. Um, and yeah, the church basically has a playbook uh, that it goes through when, uh, let's say, a, a 12 or 14 year old girl or boy approaches their parents and tells them what happened with father so and so, they will go to the church and the church has essentially a playbook where it will never use certain terms, you know, it will always attack the uh, first off gently attack the accuser and say you know what kids are like they can misinterpret etc if the parents uh, or the child wants to stay the course and continue their um uh their charges against the church then the church goes to well you know you could damage a good man's reputation we've seen cases where the people who charge the church become pariahs in their own neighborhood, lose their jobs. Do you really want that to happen to you? And then it's only the rare cases that stay with it that the church will actually open its checkbook. And if it does, it does with very draconian restrictions on it. So you never hear about them uh, in terms of the settlements, how much and what the charges were. And the church has got it down to, um, if not a science, a very strong craft. And um, even with the new Pope, it doesn't seem like it's moved that far off what it's been doing for centuries, but only recently been brought to life. Well, I love how you laid all that out in the book because, you know, we're curious as to how, you know, we hear about it happening um, and we're curious how all of these things, uh, and, and, you, and you're very thorough in this book. I mean, it's a crime thriller first, okay? And and believe me, I felt like I had to strap myself in the chair. This the, the 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 novel moved very quickly. It was very exciting. Uh, the fact that I know so little about Krav Maga, I had to look it up. I had to. I mean, I know it's from Israel. You know, the martial arts is from Israel, but I didn't know how how it differed from other martial arts. So it was a very educational book in a lot of ways. But first, it was a thriller that kept my attention. It was a vigilante justice. You call it vigilante and or pilgrim justice in your book. And we can mm -hmm. talk about that because, man, I was thinking this is like that Charles Bronson movie, you know? Yeah. He gets revenge for the for his the rape of his wife and daughter. It was that, I mean, I, <laughs> I hope there's going to be a sequel to this book and I hope there's going to be a film or a series or something. That would be quite interesting because the topic is so... Um, uh, not unusual, but so taboo. Nobody, nobody right. would think of writing a book and having this as the basis for it, except for you. <laughs> no, <laughs> it's a, so that's, it, I think that's fabulous. I, I appreciate what you're saying. Yeah, I, uh, I liked very much the direction that it took as well. Um, I was just uh, 
on the phone this morning um, with, uh, you know, conversations with people out in Hollywood or a dime a dozen, you know, et cetera. But there is some interest uh, in this being like a mini series or even a series because it's such a, if you think about buddy movies like Lethal Weapon or whatever, this is a weird buddy movie of a priest, a young priest and a cynical middle-aged woman detective. And what are they joined by? Well, they're both joined by a, a desire for justice or vengeance, depending on your definition. And if you think about it, she wants to get the people, this is, I, I don't think I'm spoiling anything. She's frustrated by the people who walk in her world because of a court. Uh, it's fine when an innocent person walks, but it frustrates the hell out of cops when someone gets off on a legal technicality and goes back to their life of whatever. Right. In, in Gabe's world, it's the idea that if you go to confession, you can have your rapes and your, you know, abuses of your spouse wiped clean and go back into your world. And in the case of the pedophilic priests that are part of his world, he's looking to exact vengeance that the church should be doing or justice and isn't. So, yeah, it's um, the idea was uh, with all of uh, the novels that I've written is uh, someone came up with the term. These are educational thrillers. I'm good with that because, as you said, you learn a lot about the Catholic Church, but not in a textbook or a nonprofit document or, or you know, uh, uh, a documentary of sorts. It was the same thing with the Holocaust novel. It was a crime thriller set in Auschwitz, but you learned a ton about the Holocaust and how the camps worked. And my first novel was about sexual violence in prisons. Again, a thriller, but in the process, you learn quite a bit about violent offenders and prisons, et cetera. So the idea is always to combine or impart a certain amount of knowledge about a, a setting with but always keep it within the context of a thriller. So what do you, what do you know about the current uh, Catholic Church's stance on pedophilia? Has anything changed? I mean, there's been, you know, there's been cases, there's been, you know, investigations, there's been charges filed. Yeah. Has anything changed? Yeah, it's it's a great question. I mean, I, I think the biggest issue is um, there's a new Pope who seems to have his, his heart in the right place. And sometimes his head is in the right place. And sometimes his head gets moved by um, the old guard. I think the bottom line is, you know, if you, if you looked at this from the standpoint of uh, zero tolerance and encouraging the church to share all of its files with the local authorities, the church is a light year away from that, even with the new Pope and his good, good heart. Um, and I think the reason for that very simply is the church is still the foremost guidance that the church has is self-preservation. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, there's a part in the book where the guy says, you know, um, when he's looking at, at Gabe, a 27 year old guy, he goes, I was looking for more of an Irish guy with a drinker's nose in his fifties. And he said, nah, those guys are kind of gone. If, you're more likely to get a Filipino guy than you are uh, the old Irish guy from the 30s. What that means, it's the same thing as with nurses today. You wonder why there's a ton of Filipino nurses. It's because they can't find enough American-born nurses, you know, and so there's always this recruiting. It's the same thing with the church. They're having to go offshore to get their next generation of priests, and they're just trying to hold on, and they're afraid that they decimate their ranks if they took a zero tolerance and went after the known pedophiles within the church. So it's, you know, it's self-preservation, number one and number two for them. Yes. Another good thing about your book is you have Gabe uh, fighting battles of his own. You know, he's, he, he, I'm not going to give that one away. Sure. Okay. And I don't want to give away the ending either because I loved, I loved what you did. I'm just mm -hmm. going to say that. I loved what you did. I, ha I have to say, I enjoyed the read. I'm so happy that, that, that uh, this novel came my way to talk to you about it. So thank you very much for writing it. I want to ask you about your other fiction books, and that is 
you've already briefly mentioned them. One was Left Alive, Left for Alive, uh, about missing persons, rape and murder in Northern California and a group of ex-cons and political refugees living in an abandoned lumber camp. You wanna talk about that one real quick? Sure, I mean, uh, and here's, uh, you know, people say, well, you know, write what you know. And I've written, you know, three novels, you know, one about pedophilia, one about the Holocaust and one about sexual violence in prison. Well, I've never been in prison. I wasn't in the Holocaust and I've never been defiled by a priest, but I know a bit about all of those. In the case of sexual violence, my wife was the, um, when we met, was uh, the uh, head of the Rape Crisis Center and uh, for Northern California. And she asked me to get involved uh, as a male in that to do counseling of male rape victims as well as husbands of women who had been raped and the husbands quite often have no idea how to deal with, with the crime as well as you know when and how to approach their wife uh, as the healing goes on. So I learned enough about that to write that book. As you pointed out, I was a, a lecturer or an assistant professor in Holocaust studies, um, something that I had studied while I was over in Israel working on digs. So when I came back to the US, I taught that for a while in 2000. I walked away from Silicon Valley for five years to um, teach again, uh, this time Holocaust and genocide at UC Santa Cruz. And so one day it occurred to me, you know, all of the things about the Holocaust that you read or see, rightfully, the Holocaust is front and center. It's the star of the show. It's blaring at you in, you know, in 64 point letters. Uh, six million killed, et cetera. And I thought, what if you backed off from that and used uh, a form that more people find attractive, like a thriller, but set it in Auschwitz so that you learn about Auschwitz, but you don't have it hammered right into your forehead saying, feel bad, you know, learn everything that you can, et cetera. So that was the, the idea behind that. And, and that's titled The Devil's Breath. That's The Devil's Breath. And that, uh, that's set in Auschwitz in 1943. And the idea, again, is, uh, I think some people know about this, but there was a gold operation at Auschwitz where they would harvest from the corpses from the gas chamber. They would harvest uh, the gold from the teeth of the victims and smelt it down and then provide it to the Third Reich. As well, they would take out the jewels that were either in the luggage or quite often with the victims, they had started secreting or secreting them in their, um, uh, in their anal cavities to avoid uh, you know, having something to barter with in the camps, but then boom. So the idea was, well, what happens if that whole operation gets compromised by a murder and the commandant has to solve it and recover the gold before the SS comes for its next shipment. And he can't do it with his guards because they'll all report him to the SS. So he has to do it by finding a detective team within the prison population. And that's what he does. He finds a husband and wife team where the husband was the head of detectives in the Warsaw ghetto and the wife was his right-hand person and an investigative reporter. And he threatens them with not just their death, but the death of all of their um, cabin mates, up to a thousand people, if they don't help him solve this crime. So that became the basis of uh, The Devil's Breath. Okay. So I'm going to ask you a question you get asked a lot. Um, and why do you write about such grip topics, sexual violence and prison life and left for alive, the Holocaust and Devil's Breath and pedophilia and the Catholic Church and the empty confessional? Why do you write about such grim topics? Well, I mean, and, and this, this isn't intended to be a flip answer, but if you hear uh, actors, they'll say, you know, uh, drama is easy, comedy is hard. You know, I've, I've never, uh, I have, uh, and, and they, get, they comment on it, and I think you've commented on it already in terms of the empty confessional. Um, I have a, a kind of a sardonic or a black sense of humor that I use in all three books so that it's not so heavy handed, but I couldn't imagine sustaining that for 350 pages. 
right. you know, uh, where is, whereas, you know, the, the themes that you were just talking about are, are easier to write about in the sense that they are, are so fascinating. I mean, uh, to give you an idea, and I never came up with an answer for this, but um, there were two elements that I could never get my hands around in writing the empty confessional is, um, number one is how would I, as a, pedoph a pedophile priest, go about recruiting other priests, which is how it happens. You know, there's going to be that moment, even if I think that you're leaning in that direction where I've got to reveal myself to you and say, hey, how would, like, how would you like to join us tonight? and and rape 12 year old kids you know i mean I, I could never envision that moment as a human being and the other one was when that priest even if he cultivates the kids with you know oh you know god is special and here's why i'm so in need of release there comes that moment where he has to cross the line into abusing a small child that trusts him and as much as I wrote it, I finally had to write it into the book and say, I can't get my hands around these two things. Yes. You know? And I like how you handled that because it, it also, because the reader feels the same way. They don't know how to get their hands around this. You know, their heads around it. You know what I mean? They just don't know. Right. <sighs> no, so, I agree. It's, it's, it's horrendous and, and it's, it's not accepted practice in the Catholic church but it sure as hell is winked at uh, and has been probably for as long as there's been a Catholic church, but certainly in the 20th century when we have files about it. Um, well, I'm glad you wrote these books. Uh, somebody has to approach the subject. Things have to come out of the closet and they have to be explored. And this is a fabulous way. Uh, you put it into such a fabulous uh, form, not format. You put it into a, a genre that mm -hmm. um, makes it, I didn't know whether to focus on the thriller part or or be angry over the the other part, the Catholic Church. I, I you know I kept flipping between the two, and I ended up on the thriller side. So yeah. kudos, you did it. Great, you, thank you. Me, you <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, you're also asked this question a lot. You uh, you're a professor of Holocaust studies. How did you end up running corporate marketing at a company like Oracle? And well, no, I'm gonna wait. I'm gonna wait for the second half. You answer that one first. No, I uh, and yes, you're right. I mean, uh, you nailed the two questions that I had asked the most. <laughs> is, you know, why the hell are you such a grim son of a bitch? And you know, <laughs> number two is um, uh, how did it happen? I can guarantee you that it would never happen today. Uh, what happened was, um, in fact, I was speaking at a retreat for um, a human rights organization. And uh, when I was still teaching Holocaust studies and one of the people on the board of the organization was uh, a really, uh, he was the CEO of a large company, not Larry Ellison at that point. And he came up to me after my presentation. He said, why don't you ride back with me to San Jose? And uh, I wanna talk to you about something. And he said, this valley, it wasn't even known as Silicon Valley, I don't think at that point, you know, is about to explode. Uh, if, you're, if you're done with teaching or if you want to make a different change, et cetera, um, you should get into it now. And that was it, is that basically, they were hiring anyone who could put a noun in front of a verb. Uh, it, was, um, it was the early days of Apple, et cetera. So I went with his company and then went from that company to Oracle. And I joined Oracle when Oracle was 90 million in sales. And, you know, um, uh, I was the only corporate marketing guy. And then the, the great thing about Oracle is, I don't know that I would recommend it as a business practice, but it doesn't trust outsiders. It does not want uh, Elaine Gallant to come in and say, you know, when I was at Xerox, we did it this way. They want to hire people who are inexperienced, but uh, that they think are, are bright. They were determined to be the number one uh, employer of Harvard, MIT, and Stanford graduates. And in fact, they did. 
you know, those people would even be working the front desk and then move their way in, kind of like people starting in the mailroom in the uh, agency business in Hollywood. So the point was, I got there early. They hired beneath me and kept promoting me until all of a sudden, I'm the head of corporate marketing for a billion dollar corporation. But it happened for two reasons. One was that early hiring talent drought. And then secondly, Oracle's refusal to bring in experienced people above me. They'd rather promote you. And that was how it happened. It would never happen that way today. Well, you're a lucky man because you went on to, to form Crowded Ocean. We could probably have a whole show just on that. Mm -hmm. I'm saying I want to strap myself in, but you did write. Um, if, have uh, can we show the website, please? Uh, uh, Tom's website, Tom Hogan's website, because you have several books, and I do want to just take one thirty seconds sure. to talk about the Ultimate Startup Guide, Marketing Lessons, War Stories, and Hard Won Advice from Leading Venture Capitalists and Angel Investors. And then I want to mention your new one because I love the terminology you're using. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> There's your website. And you there can we are. Um, so uh, oh, your book. The, ulti uh, the ultimate startup guide uh, came about, you know what it is, 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 well, number one is we, we were introduced as the people who wrote the book on startup marketing because we'd launched so many of them. Uh, and then we thought, well, what the hell, then probably we should write the book and then we can be introduced uh, formally that way and people will buy the book. What had happened was um, uh, my partner in Crowded Ocean, Carol Broadbent, had been uh, my counterpart at Sun Microsystems back in their early days. And she had put Sun on the map the way that hopefully I had helped put Oracle on the map. And then we met later in life at another company. And then we both went off and did other things and came back together to form Crowded Ocean. And the, what was great about Crowded Ocean was we didn't really prospect for work. What would happen is the VCs, the venture capitalists who knew us from Oracle and Sun days, were delighted to have people that they knew and trusted that they could bring in to the startups that they were investing in and say, hey, listen, you know, uh, I love your stuff. The technology is there. By the way, you've never run a company. You've never organized a sales uh, team. You've never built a website. Here's the people who've done it at Oracle and Sun and for at that point, 20 of our customers, many of whom had become famous by then. You know, if someone gives you $8 million and then recommends that you use Crowded Ocean, you're probably gonna use Crowded Ocean. Yeah, it's I'm gonna leave it there, Tom, because we are out of time. I didn't even get to mention your new book. Dark on it, but it's called Tumor Humor. So. It is, just uh, go to the website. I appreciate all of the time, Elaine. And, uh, mm -hmm download tom you're very diverse uh, you, you're a true renaissance man i'm so happy it shows in your work uh, it's of such a pleasure to meet you thank you for joining us i want to thank everyone at think tech the the technicians jay fidel our producer all our uh supporters our underwriters our viewers thank you so much we can't do it without you tom come back and visit us sometime Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.